he's my IT guy. <laughs> um, well, last um, winter when I heard about Callie being in Baltimore, I thought, you know, somebody's got to do something about The Wire because I was right in the thick of watching all of the DVDs of The Wire, and it's such a fabulous show. And it's all about the law, and it's all about Baltimore. So after a while, when nobody seemed to be signing up for that, I decided I would sign up to do it. So I'm doing it as a huge fan of The Wire. Um, have, any, have all of you seen The Wire at all? Anybody? Raise your hand if you've seen it at all. Okay. All are. <laughs> How many of you have seen all five seasons? OK, all right. I'm, <laughs> Rip it, actually. That's Rip, wow. <laughs> That's true. And um, I have seen all five seasons at least, every, every episode at least twice. So I'm like the expert in the room, I think. <laughs> Although Jason's seen it all, too. Um, you want to tell some our disclaimer? Uh, well, basically, this is all entertainment. It's nothing <laughs> real serious or anything like that. So don't take anything literally or anything like that. Um, don't take anything. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> I mean, this is all about fun and entertainment, just to know a little bit more about the show and maybe create more fans of the show, basically, because it's based here in Walmart. So just enjoy yourself and sit back and relax. We're going to show a lot of clips and talk a little bit about the technology, because it is, after all, called The Wire. So, OK. This is the introduction to season one. Thank you. 
what you pass for free, give me some better idea on how I can be Jay Ball. I paid you. The guy who wrote The Wire is a guy named David Simon, and um, he wanted, he and his co-producer, who's named Ed Burns, are both um, Baltimoreans. David Simon worked for the Baltimore Sun for many years as a, a um, following the police, as a police reporter. Um, Ed Burns was actually on the Baltimore police force for 20 years, and then he taught in the Baltimore public schools for another eight years. So they know the city intimately, and they wanted to make a show that was really about the American city. And even though it's set in Baltimore and it shows a lot about Baltimore, um, they make it very clear that this is that they're trying to show what's happening across America in American cities, especially um, the kind of cities like Baltimore or Pittsburgh or Cleveland. The kind of cities that are just kind of struggling, um, struggling along, basically. And this is a, another David Simon. Um, there's a lot of quotes from David Simon because he talks a lot. And um, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you 
you ever look, try to look up the wire, all you're going to find is quotes from David Simon. But um, he says that cities in the Rust Belt, Baltimore, Cleveland, St. Louis, Chicago, these are places that are experiencing the most profound problems, not only with crime and intractable drug culture, but also with an almost existential crisis of the population. And we can't solve the problems of the city without first addressing them intelligently. And I think what he tries to do is go beyond your basic cops and robbers, bad guys, good guys show, and show that um, everybody in society is good and bad, and the bad guys aren't all that bad, and the good guys aren't all that good. And that um, the problems lie more with the um, structure of the city and its institutions. Um, and he's very, um, he's very conscious of what he's trying to do. A lot of people call The Wire Shakespearean because I don't know if you could tell from that clip that the dialogue is very rich, it's very, um, it's very moving, it's very emotional, it's very Shakespearean, but he th thinks it's more like a Greek tragedy because there's no, um, because the ending is tragic. Um, it's the police department or the drug economy or the political structures or the schools that are throwing the lightning bolts and hitting people in the ass for no reason. And he focuses on institutional failure. He sees that the institutions that we've all set up in our government and so forth to deal with um, society have failed to, to move along and to deal with the problems that we're having today. So the way that they do this, they, they did this very deliberately. Um, to, they made it five seasons. They didn't want it to be any more or any less. And they dealt with five different aspects of the city. Um, the first season was about the drug trade. And as you can see, that was the intro to the first season. It introduces a whole lot of um, characters who are involved in drugs. Some people are in gangs. Uh, Omar is this guy who just holds people. He holds up drug dealers is what he does. He robs them. Um, you see some of the police and what they're doing. Um, the second season, they kind of switch focus because they want, they want people to think not only of the drug trade, but also of the working class. So they focus on the port of Baltimore, and you learn about um, the working class longshoremen in Baltimore who are also struggling because their economy is slipping away, and they can't even afford to live in the houses that their um, you know, grandparents lived in a little while ago. So it, it, it develops a plot in the ports, although it keeps the Barksdale story going. And the third season is go, kind of goes back to the drug trade, but it also starts to develop the government bureaucracy and why that is just not working. The fourth season is the schools, and it's my favorite um, season. It, they really look at the schools and where all the drug dealers are coming from. Why are these people growing up like this? And they actually go into a middle school for the whole year and spend it with four boys in a middle school. And then season five, they examine the media and how they sort of almost conspire to keep things the way they are. Okay, why the way? Well, I thought we ought to have some kind of an IT hook to hang this on. <laughs> so um, the title specifically refers to the electronic surveillance methods that they used um, in, the, in the wire. And every season, there's some kind of wiretapping going on, eavesdropping wiretapping. Um, so there's a lot of surveillance cameras, and one of the sort of subplots is the way our society is becoming a surveillance society where there's just cameras watching you everywhere. They're, you know, everybody's watching your communication on the internet. Um, you can't really get away from it. Okay, can you talk about wiretapping? Um, what I'm going to do now is go more in depth into wiretapping, basically, because the name of the show is The Wire. and Basically, this is one way to use evidence to catch, basically, the drug dealers or whatever. So wiretapping is the monitoring of telephone and internet conversation by a third party, often by convert means. The telephone tap or wiretap received this name because historically, the monitoring connection was applied to the wires of the telephone line being monitored and drew off or tapped a small amount of electrical signal carrying the conversation. The legal, legalized wiretapping by police or other recognized, recognized governmental authorities, otherwise known as lawful interception. So basically, the legal terminology for wiretapping or eavesdropping is lawful interception. Um, a little history note, uh, telephone wiretapping began in the 1890s. 
um, which is really interesting. And it didn't become constitutional until 1928. So now we're going to go into more in depth of the legal term terminology of wiretapping, which is lawful interception. Uh, lawful interception is the interception of telecommunications by law enforcement agencies and intelligence services in accordance with local law after following due process and receiving proper authorization from competent authorities. Now, um, through lawful interception, it's govern the, the government, I guess, the governmental body of lawful interception is assessed by the Communication Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, which is also known as CALEA. Uh, to ensure systematic procedures for carrying out interceptions while also lowering the cost of interception solution, industry groups and governmental government agencies worldwide have attempted to standardize, standardize the technical process behind lawful interception. One organization known as ETSI, the European, European Telecommunication Standard Institute, which was developed in 1988, has been a major driver in lawful interception standards, not only for Europe, but worldwide. Now, I'm going to go into details of some of the equipment they use in the show that they, you might, they might have mentioned in little tidbits. Um, bugs are basically small or a combination of miniature radio transmitter with a microphone. So basically, they uh, you know put a very small thing in, in phones or in different rooms to overhear a conversation. Um, to hear the conversation, they use radio scanners. Um, they automatically tune or scan two or more discrete frequencies, stopping when it finds a signal on one of them, and then cont continuing to scan other frequencies when the initial transmission ceases. So basically, the bug is set at a frequency, and the radio scanner basically uh, <coughs> receives, the, uh, receives the sound from the, uh, the transmitter. Uh, fiber optics is a glass or plastic fiber that carries light along its length. Uh, transmission over long distances and higher data rates than other forms of communication. Basically, they use these for mainly for cameras, basically. They're very hard to, to notice, so they use them for camera to view uh, activity that's going on. And a trigger fish, um, which is a device that catches a cell phone number for, from a, a close location that receives the information from a cell tower. So this diagram here basically uh, shows the, uh, the architecture that communication companies have to design that's enforced by the, go uh, by the government, basically. Um, this uh, design, this uh, diagram or design was designed by the European uh, te uh, Telecommunications Standard Institute. And basically, they have this design worldwide. It's not just here in the US, but it's worldwide that they have to set their standards like this. Um, basically, the diagram is a systematic and extensible means by which network <coughs> operators and law enforcement agents can interact, especially as networks grow in sophistication and scope of service. This architecture applies to not only traditional wire and wireless voice calls, but to IP-based services such as voice over IP, email, instant messages, etc. The architecture is now applied worldwide with some variation in terminology. And there's three stages which this architecture is supposed to do or supposed to help the law enforcement agencies. Uh, one is collection where target-related call data and contact are extracted from the network. Uh, two, the mediation where the data is formatted to, co to conform to specific standards. And three, delivery of the data and content to law enforcement agencies. So basically, instead of placing bugs or any devices into over here in conversation, basically law enforcement agencies just have to make a phone call basically to the communication companies to basically have a wiretap or some type of surveillance for somebody. I'm going to just talk briefly about what law governs wiretapping, and then we're going to go into the, the show and um, how the technology is used. Um, wiretapping law is codified in the um, 18 USCA, I mean USC um, 2510 et al. And as Jason said, it, it's been um, legal for a long time. They keep updating it so that as new technologies come along, they can continue to um, eavesdrop into wiretap along with cell phones and so forth. Um, under federal law, a judge can, auth can authorize a wiretap with these particular um, requirements are met. And in the show, you'll see that 
they're constantly trying to get judges to give them wiretaps. Um, they, the police have to get find probable cause, and they're always trying to jimmy up some probable cause because then they can take it to Rhonda Perlman, who's their state's attorney that they work with, and then she can decide if it really is probable cause, and then she has to go to the judge and try to get the, um, the authorization for the wiretap. And all of this is taking time, and of course the drug dealers are extremely skittish about technology in general. They have no computers, and they, you know, they try to never use cell phones. They try to never talk on the phone. They never say any names on the phone. So it's just this kind of cat and mouse game going back and forth. Um, Oh, here's, a, here's another famous Maryland wiretap case. This was a case where um, this was a, a personal wiretapping, and there's stricter laws that apply if a person wants to actually tap somebody's phone. Um, but I, I tried to look into this, and the, the, all the case stuff seems to be like locked up. You can't really see it. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to find out what happened to Monica Lewinsky and Linda Tripp. Um, <laughs> and Kalia was the was sort of as Jason mentioned that the, that's the one that has addressed the uh, cell phone issue because it used to be you were just kind of listening to a conversation now you actually have to go out and intercept the stuff and uh, you know digital stuff and grab it and um, they they basically kept it the same but but the technology has gotten much more expensive for everybody and then there's the they also, in the wire, they use these things called pen registers and trap and trace devices, which aren't actual eavesdropping things, but they are, um, they let you find out what phone numbers are being called or you are calling from. And they're governed by the same kinds of rules where you need a judge to approve them and so forth. And you, yeah. All right. And there's also a requirement in um, the in the statutes that um, yeah, they have to report. Every state attorney general has to report on any wiretapping they're doing. So um, they have to give details and they have to report once a year on every wiretap that they've done. So there's a lot of good statistics on it. Um, these are, this is the list of all of the um, information that they're required to give. So all of the people, um, the approximate nature and frequency of incriminating communication, the number, um, and the number of people whose communications were intercepted, the number of calls that were intercepted. And then once a year, the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts publishes their wiretap report, which you can get online at this um, address, at this URL. So some statistics since you probably don't want to look at the report, <clears throat> there were 2,208 wiretaps requested in 2007. Um, only 457 were requested by the feds, which is the, probably mostly the FBI and the DEA. Um, then 1,751 by state. There have been 15,000 wiretaps since 1997. There have only been four requests for wiretaps refused since 1997. 94% uh, of wiretaps were for portable devices, either pagers or cell phones. 81% of wiretaps were for drug-related crime. And oh, the average cost of a wiretap is like 50, almost $50,000. 30% $50, um, of wiretaps were actually incriminating in 2007 compared to 20% to in 2006. And in 2007, there were no applications denied. Four states account for almost 80% of the applications. California, New York, New Jersey, and guess what? Maryland! <laughs> I don't know if it's Linda Tripp or if it's The Wire or what. Um, and state investigators list, listened in on more than 3 million phone conversations, mostly about drug crimes. Six states don't authorize their own state agencies to use wiretaps, but most states have their own laws that mirror the uh, federal law. All right, season one. Uh, We're just going to watch clips from now on. I think that's what they would do. Turn it up just a little bit. How, yeah, how do you do that? Hold on, let me see this. See this one. Um, season, oh, yeah. season one basically focuses on the drug trade, and basically the first season introduced two major groups of characters, the Baltimore Police Department and the drug dealing organization run by the Barksdale family. The season follows the investigation of the latter by the former. Um, 
the technology of, I guess, in this, that's introduced in the season is eventually the investigation takes the direction of electronic surveillance with wiretaps and pager clones to infiltrate the security measures taken by the Barksdale organization. This leads the investigation to areas the com commanding officers had hoped to avoid, including political contributions. All right, this is, the, this is the first scene of the first episode of The Wire, and you, you meet um, Officer Jimmy McNulty, who's sort of the, the star of the series, if anyone is. <clears throat> This America man. <clears throat> so what happened in that scene, you, you may have had difficulty understanding the speech. Um, David Simon and Ed Burns insisted on hiring many, many of their um, parts are played by kids who are actually ghetto kids from Baltimore and their speech is hard to understand. I got, when you buy the uh, DVDs, you can turn on the, you know, the translate, the subtitle thing and it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> But in that scene, um, <clears throat> someone's been shot, a guy named Snot Boogie, and, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and um, Jimmy, so, you know, and, and Officer McNulty so, as asking why he was shot, and apparently he, 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 every Friday night he plays a craps, craps game with his friends, and he, then he steals all the money, and Jimmy said, well, why do you let him play? And the answer is, hey, this is America, man. You can't stop somebody from playing craps. Now, oops, we go back. There, that's the, um, and this is the Barksdale gang. They're sort of the focus of the first season, and they also play a, a role throughout the five seasons. Um, the guy in the middle is D'Angelo. You saw him in court, and he was he murdered somebody and was tried for it, and then they intimidated the witnesses, so he didn't get. To, he was uh, let off. Um, this guy over here is Weebay, who's the enforcer, and. Stringer Bell, who's right behind D'Angelo, is kind of the brains behind the whole Barksdale gang. I'm not sure who he is. I think that other guy is Orlando, the guy who owned, who fronts that uh, strip club that everybody... Stinkle. Is it Stinkum? I think so. All right. I, who, how about the guy on the other side of D'Angelo? I don't know. Anyway, you get to know all of these characters very well. Um, another cur recurring character, and this is how they depict the law, is Mari Levy is the uh, drug dealer's lawyer, and um, he's kind of sleazy, but he's rich, and he's kind of likable in a weird way, and um, he always gets them off, and he, you know, represents all of the drug dealers in Baltimore. And at one point, somebody says to him, hey, you know, you're the same as us. You've got the briefcase, I got the shotgun. We're both doing this. We're both making money off of this. And that's Judge Phelan. He's the guy who has to write all of the orders to, um, to get the wiretaps. Oh, yeah. This is a picture of, in the first season when they're doing the bugs, it's kind of easy because they're using cell phones and pagers. So they get paged. And then this is uh, D'Angelo going to the phone. Um, D'Angelo runs the low-rise um, projects. There's a high-rise project, too. But he's, and he um, wishes he had that one, but he doesn't. And he gets paged when, when they need to re-up on the drugs. And um, then he goes and he you know, calls somebody and gets the drugs delivered. So they have this long string of people so that none of the big guys ever get implicated or caught. And this is, this is D'Angelo playing with his guys out in the courtyard of the low rises, teaching them how to play chess. 
this one. This is where Bodhi breaks the camera. That's uh, Detective Freeman has um, figured out ha that the number for um, for the payphone that they're using. So now they can bug the payphone. And um, there we go. Then they, they finally get some equipment. They, they're using kind of these old computers, but they actually had a guy who um, called the electronics coordinator, and his whole job is basically to make the computers look realistic and to make all of the, you know, the screens look realistic. They also had to go, and whenever a telephone number gets mentioned, they have to make sure that nobody's ever going to have that telephone number so they don't get sued. Um, that's the detail squadron, uh, squad room. And I showed that because um, one of the things that they really try to do is take a surveillance look at a lot of places. So. Um, the, the people who were the directing were very aware of the fact that they wanted to make it look like surveillance sometimes because a lot of the, um, the work that they were doing had to do with either or, uh, you know, audio surveillance or with the surveillance cameras that they were using, like the one Bodhi broke. And then, oh, Prez, cra yeah, Prez cracks the code by, they, they were picking up all these numbers and trying to figure out, they couldn't figure out what the code was, they weren't right, and he finally figured out that it was a very easy code that was just, they used every opposite number. Oh, yeah. And there's, towards the end, Levy with Stringer and Avon. Avon Barksdale is kind of the head of the organization. Stringer's like the money man and the brains. And um, they're tr just trying to keep out of jail at this point. Okay. But what happens at the end is there is a bust, as you could kind of see in that clip. and. I think D'Angelo went to jail, Avon went to jail briefly, and Weebay went to jail. Only because one of the policemen got shot. And I mean, it's just, they do a ton of work and nobody really ever seems to get arrested or go to jail. Okay. Um, the second season switches focus now. Um, the focus now it examines the plight of the blue collar urban working class as exemplified by longshoremen in the city port. As some of them get caught up in smuggling drugs, et cetera, inside the containers, cans that they're, they're port ships. Uh, the technology that's used in, during the season is the first clue to, to cracking the murder case comes when BD realized that all the information about the port activity are logged into a computer. By examining the computer, the police are able to figure out how the longshoremen are able to help smugglers. Uh, the police again use wire taps to infiltrate the crime ring. Yeah, this is a season two recap. <coughs> you keep us guessing, don't you, Stan? We loaded up a window, boy. You're renovating the aid. We could use another window, but can't you with your process of vodka? I spot gas that kind of money. I have people working on a window for St. Patrick's. Now there's one window too many. You don't want my finger in your eye. You better do much right here. Need a detail. Get some guys showing a lot of money. Port guys, long show. What's the detail? Stan Valchek has got some personal issues with somebody in one of the port unions. I choose my own pick. Thank you, boy. You need to go see the green scout on the way. Who are you from? Oh, he's sick. Michael's kid. Long time. 
It's sitting out there waiting. This rush you will take it off the plate at the customs sales, bro. Someone's gonna see it. They're gonna think we're losing the stack.
a nephew. He knows my name, but my name is not my name. And you? So then you're only the Greek. I'm not even Greek. So what's left of the case? We pulled in everyone caught up in the white attempts, leaving only me and my 14 bodies. Anything about this deal you don't understand? For a while, I don't need to talk to no one but you people. What about Russia? He drove for him. But if somebody had to get hurt, he was probably going to be around for that part of it, too. We're looking for anything out of the ordinary. You might want to have a look see at the videotapes. This has nothing to do with me. This is aggravated murder and kidnapping. It's a death penalty case. You're going to tell me right now. Echo Hotel, and Del Arbor. Business a pleasure for you. Business. Always business. I know mean, you locked up some people, right? But Frank is still going to be dead. You guys move on to something new. No one looks back. We're gonna get done by five. We need to maybe sp speed through a little bit. But the second season, um, there's a big smuggling ring, millions of dollars worth of heroin and cocaine, and the longshoremen are sort of making a deal with the devil because they need the money and the power. So they allow the smuggling to go on, and then um, then they and, and then some girls get who were prostitutes getting shipped in died, and they found out about it. So it turns into a big police case. But in the end, as you can see, they don't catch the big guys. Despite all the wiretaps and the computers and so forth, um, all they catch is the one little Russian guy. And I think that's the only one they caught in that season after all that work. So, uh, um, hmm? Omar? Let's, okay, let's show this one clip. This is Omar, who is one of the great characters of this. He agrees to give evidence against one of Barksdale's guys because his uh, boyfriend was murdered, he thinks, by the Barksdales. Ain't working out for y'all, huh? Mars is the god of war, right? Planet two. Well, I know it's a planet, but the clue is Greek god of war. Ares. Greeks call him Ares. Same dude, different name is all. Ares fits. Thanks. It's all good. See, back in middle school and all that's the love of myths. This stuff was deep. Truly. Hey, what? Yeah, the, the attorney general told him to uh, wear a tie. Today calls Omar Little, Your Honor. There's Maury Levy defending the bad guy, bird again. Right. Omar is homosexual, so they're all down at him about that. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Sure, do. State your name for the record. Omar the Bone Little. Mr. Little, how old are you? About 29, they're about. And where do you live? No place in particular, man. You're homeless? And uh, where, so to speak. And what is your occupation? Occupation? What exactly do you do for a living, Mr. Little? I rip and run. You? I rob drug dealers. And exactly how long has this been your occupation, Mr. Little? Oh, I don't know exactly. I venture to say maybe about eight or nine years. But Mr. Little, how does a man rob drug dealers for eight or nine years and live to tell about it? Uh, eight a time, I suppose. In the parking lot when the assailant drew his gun? They're yeah, about. And do you see the gunman who killed Mr. Gant anywhere in the courtroom today? Hey, yo, what up, Bird? For the record, you are identifying the defendant, Marquise Hilton. It's just Bird to me. And Mr. Little, you had seen him many times before, had you not? Yeah, we jailed together down the cut. Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? Quite a bit the same. Well, we're going to shoot this old man. 
street center little clocksicles on the east side. It's the end of some National Avenue, niggas. It's the word on the street, huh? The trouble is, King, we ain't on the street. We ain't a court of law. Your Honor, objection is noted and preserved for the record. Mr. Levy, move on. Thank you, Your Honor. Jurors will disregard that last comment from the witness in which he explained where he had last encountered the defendant. Yes or no, Mr. Little? Prior to the shooting, did you know the defendant? I mean, I knew the man, but it wasn't like he was no friend of nothing. So you would have no trouble recognizing him from a moderate distance, say, 20, 25 yards in daylight? Oh, no, no problem. Mr. Little, do you recognize this particular weapon? That's Bird's gun, the 380. You've seen it before? Bird was flashing that thing. So you'd actually seen it before the day in question? And on the day in question? It was a bird hand. When you shot at Mr. Gant? Yes, ma'am. Bird covered those shiny little pistols. Objection, Your Honor. And the boy too tight and the double off even after a daytime murder. Senate will regain control and be forcibly restrained, and I will clear the court. The witness's last answer is to be stricken and disregarded by the jury. Can I ask why you came forward in this case? I told the police what I know. Were you offered anything in exchange? Like what? Were you arrested? Were you going to be charged with a crime, and by testifying, did the police agree to drop those charges? No, man, it ain't about that. How many times have you been arrested as an adult, Mr. Little? Shot in North County. No, I'm doing that to take it personal. Possession of a handgun, possessing a concealed weapon, assault by pointing, robbery, deadly weapon, possession of a handgun again, followed by violation of parole on weapon charges, followed by one count of attempted murder, and use of a handgun in commission of a felony. That wasn't no attempt murder. What was it, Mr. Little? I shot the boy in white, Mike, and his hand crossed that off. He didn't fix it so he couldn't sit right. <laughs> Why'd you shoot Mike Mike and his, um, his hind parts, Mr. Little? You say we had a disagreement. A disagreement over? Well, you see, Mike Mike used to keep that cocaine he was slinging, and the money he was making from slinging it. I thought otherwise. So you rob drug dealers? This is what you do? Yes, sir. You walk the streets of Baltimore with a gun, taking what you want, when you want it, willing to use violence when your demands aren't met. This is who you are. Why should we believe your testimony, then? Why believe anything you say? That's up to y'all, really. You say you are here testifying against the defendant because of any deal you made with police. True that. That you're here because you, you, you want to tell the truth about what happened to Mr. Gant in that housing project parking lot. Yep. When in fact you are exactly the kind of person who would, if you felt you needed to, shoot a man down on a housing project parking lot and then lie to the police about it, would you not? Hey look, I ain't gonna put my gun on no citizen. You are immoral. Are you not? You are feeding off the violence and the despair of the drug trade. You're stealing from those who themselves are stealing the lifeblood from our city. You are a parasite who leeches off Just like you, the culture man. of drugs. Excuse me? What? I got the shotgun. I got the briefcase. So the game though, right? Thank you, Detective. Nothing further. Anything more on redirect, Ms. Nathan? No, Your Honor. Let's take ten minutes and then run the closing arguments. I have every intention of beginning tomorrow with jury instructions. Uh, Bird got found guilty. So I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. Maybe we should just fast forward to the um, to the end of the fifth season. It just, I'm not going to give it away to whoever people did not want to know. But, but the wrap-up for the fifth season is kind of poignant. And I'm sorry I can't look at the fourth season because that's really, really, really good. Yeah, let's just go down to...
remember, but I'm just sitting there in the judge's seat. Okay, I think that's, okay, yeah, this is the, the finale at the end of the fifth season, which none of us wanted to happen. All of this was shot in Baltimore, in the, the bad neighborhoods that they're showing. Um, I don't know where he is right now. It's only like one shot of the Inner Harbor the whole time. This is the theme song. This season was about the Baltimore Sun, set in the newsroom a lot of it. Out of the drug gang, those are the only two guys who actually end up in jail for any amount of time.
Looks like it's down at the harbor. That's just a picture of David Simon. With his computer, as you notice, he's a Mac user. And um, the re he says the reason he made it from Baltimore, and I just don't want anybody to think we're you know, down on Baltimore. It's a great city. He says, I'm not from somewhere else. I'm from Baltimore, so that's what I write about. So I'm sorry I didn't get to go through all the seasons, but I very much encourage you to read the DVDs. The DVDs. It's, a fabulous it's also being shown on BET now. But they take out all the cursing, yeah. so it kind of loses a little. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions about it? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Pro. <laughs> I saw where um, on what on the uh, Edge of the American West blog you were talking about how this is the best show ever, and David Simon commented uh, on one of their blog posts, and they, the owners of the site were just ecstatic. <laughs> he reads our blog. He reads our blog. <laughs> it's such a fabulous show. It's just it's Diner? No, um, his Homicide. He made the show Homicide, and The Corner is another the show. Diner, Diner of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? Yeah. Kevin Bacon. Yeah. A movie. Yeah. 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 A movie. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not from Baltimore. I just love this show. Yeah. <laughs> well, all those John Waters movies. <laughs> yeah, John Waters loves this show too. <laughs>